Hi friends, welcome again to Soaring Through Chaos. And as always, uh, the reason we do these um, conversations is to help support each other to really create community. We are going through some of the more challenging, chaotic times in our lives, whether it's the pandemic, the health concerns, or it's the loss of jobs and changes in the employment and employability, or it's the divisiveness that we see in society. I think it's time we really kind of look inwards. And uh, every once in a while, I come across people who changed my life or the life of my family. And one of them is Denise Brousseau. Denise, we got to know you in the late 90s, early 2000s. And you had founded an organization called Forum for Women Entrepreneurs. I must say it changed our lives because my wife, uh, Dr. Seema Handu, became a part of it in the very first um, leadership training that you offered with some of the amazing leaders from the San Francisco Bay Area. And now she's leading projects in Asia and in India, many, many places. So first of all, thank you. And tell us, how did you get into leadership for women? Wow, uh, you know, it, it's amazing. You know, you don't want to admit it was that long ago, but uh, it's great to reconnect. And I love hearing that your wife is still leading amazing organizations around the globe. So, you know, we started the Forum for Women Entrepreneurs actually in 1993. And it was actually as a, I uh, came together with a woman that I'd gone to business school with at Stanford. And she had been doing a research project while we were at Stanford on why were women not getting any venture funding? And her father was a venture capitalist. She herself went into venture after we graduated, but her, her exploration, her senior project, as it were, her second year project was you know, what, what was leading to the fact that only, I think at the time, less than 1% of the venture capital funding was going to women entrepreneurs. And so as she graduated, um, she approached myself and a few others to say, you know, we really ought to do something about this. There's, and so we, she had kicked around a couple of ideas, but at that time she decided she wanted to start a, an organization to address this issue. And so I kind of came on board at the beginning and for the next 10 years, it was really a, a passion project and then a full-time job. Yeah, and what is interesting was you had such a really good background with Stanford GSB and you could, we, it was smack in the middle of the biggest growth in probably in American history with the dot-coms. And so there were lots and lots of opportunities. In fact, you were working on some cutting edge projects with people from MIT before this. What made you go into this full time? Well, I I mean, my own background is at 26 years old, I started my very first company and uh, didn't know anything about what I was doing. <laughs> and so I was working in the tech industry, um, actually in telecom and then eventually in software. And uh, at, in the telecom field, I got a Macintosh computer put on my desk as part of my job. And I just fell in love with this little computer and, and eventually set up my own computer consulting business and training people on Macs and whatever and had this successful business, but really didn't understand how to scale it. Like I could run a one person consultancy, but how do you build a real business? So part of the reason I went back to school at Stanford was to get that that background and that degree, but I also had a real passion for nonprofits. So uh, interestingly enough, I got a degree in entrepreneurship and managing nonprofits, and then I founded an organization, a nonprofit for entrepreneurs. It all kind of came together, which was lovely. Um, but, you know, the for five years after business school, I did this on the side. I was my passion project. I was doing, you know, events all year long, but I had a full-time job. And finally, I don't know, 1997, 1998, it's, it was getting bigger and bigger. And I think we hit about 300 members and we decided we got to get serious about this. Like, this is not something I can do in my, I was running to Asia every month for my job. And, you know, I had all kinds of other things going on and and oh I'm running this small nonprofit <laughs> like that wasn't small anymore. So I um, my co-founder who was the chair of the board, I was the CEO, she convinced me to quit my day job and go do this full time. And so I started full time January of ninety eight and it was just 
a wild ride from there because as you said, it was this huge growth for women, for entrepreneurship, as well as for women entrepreneurs. And it was, it was a ton of money flowing. And so we went from one office to two, three, four, seven offices um, in just a few short years and really had a wild ride. It was, it was a ton of fun. In fact, I remember, as, as you said, the, there were only 1% of the money was flowing to women entrepreneurs. Have things changed now over the years? Are things any I, better? Oh, Shankar, I wish I could say, of course, we've had enormous change, but the <laughs> sad thing is, it has not moved a lot. I think the most we've ever gotten to, maybe 4%, maybe 6% in a really good year, and then I think two years ago, it was back down to 2%. I mean, it just breaks your heart. It is a very, very intractable problem. And it's particularly intractable because almost all the venture firms are run by men and they That's seem to true. follow their buddies. And then it's interesting also that even in the software industry, which is predominantly dominated by men, the few women entrepreneurs who came to run companies, whether it's Carly Fiorina at uh, uh, Hewlett Packard or it was Meg Whitman with eBay, they all came during turnarounds. Uh, Yahoo had one. Amazing people who was, uh, uh, you know, and, and of course we've got uh, Facebook with, uh, you know, parental leadership from, uh, uh, you know, uh, amazing, amazing people. Uh, what well, surprises? We separate because when the company goes so wrong, they figure, all right, well, then we'll let a woman run it because, you know, she can't make it any worse. <laughs> <laughs> but in each time, each time they've turned it around and turned it around miraculously in many cases. But um, you would think to give people a clue that you could let women run it before you run it into the ground. <laughs> it just doesn't seem to, and there's been so much research that shows that a diverse management team, diverse and management. Uh, you know, board of advisors and board of directors leads to such better outcomes. But for some reason, this parochial mindset of what an entrepreneur looks like is, you know, a guy in a hoodie from Stanford, engineer who's, you know, 23 to 25. They have a very clear view of what these people are supposed to look like. And we don't look like that. And it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. For what it's right. worth, um, uh, when, uh, when, when, uh, when we founded the company, Seema and I, um, it, it needed like big time marketing because it was the dot com days. So I was the storyteller. But as soon as we got serious in terms of uh, first we got the money, but then we had to really deliver products to the pharmaceutical industry, to the healthcare space. That's not a marketing gimmick. That requires serious work. It's like you know saying COVID vaccine will be there in one month. No, no COVID vaccine come out, can come out in one month. It takes years of hard work. So that's when uh, Seema actually, I, I requested Seema, you be the CEO because this requires real operations, real tenacity and real work. So, and she did a fantastic job. I, if it was me, I would have kept telling stories, but stories were not enough. Um, so yes, there have been many examples, many examples of success when the nature of leadership has to shift to the needs of the market. And uh, which reminds me, you have worked on so many different things since the FWE days. Could you give us a glimpse of what you've been up to over the years? And you've worked on very diverse things, not just yeah. business entrepreneurship. Could you tell us and uh, people listening here the kind of things Denise has been up to? So I've had a very eclectic resume all the way along. So even when I was running the Forum for Women Entrepreneurs, I had the opportunity to start Springboard, which was the first venture capital conference for women entrepreneurs. And the remarkable, I mean, both of those organizations continue today, many, many years later. Springboard just celebrated 20 year anniversary and uh, FWB celebrated 25th anniversary about a year and a half ago. And um, Springboard has helped women, I think we've had 20 IPOs, including Constant Contact, and uh, um, we've had Canva, we've had uh, Invisalign, a number of companies that we helped, and as well as many IP, uh, um, many M&A, uh, mil billions of dollars raised. I think we're up to 8 billion uh, funding for women entrepreneurs. So that became, it went from being a venture conference to being really a global accelerator for women entrepreneurs. 
And so both of those uh, Forum for Women Entrepreneurs, although it doesn't have a lot of chapters anymore, still continues in the Bay Area. So both of those were, I helped birth both of those. And then um, I went on from there to do politics for a while, which um, was another, a whole different kind of adventure. I worked with a guy who was a candidate for governor of California, who had been a professor of mine at Stanford Business School. And so I worked on his race for 14 months. Unfortunately, he lost um, in the primary and then that election ended up getting won by Arnold Schwarzenegger. So he wouldn't have won in the, he wouldn't have won in the regular <laughs> race. <laughs> that was not a good year for him. Um, and then I, let's see, what else did I do? Oh, um, I started my own consulting practice, uh, which was really initially, I was thinking it was going to be more about careers, but pretty quickly it turned into the organization that it is today, which is the Thought Leadership Lab. And I became a um, sort of a, it's very kind of meta concept. I became a thought leader about thought leadership and uh, I wrote a book and started teaching courses in thought leadership. And then recently I helped start a uh, new organization in the healthcare space, helping build the future healthcare workforce. So I have not been bored. <laughs> it's been <laughs> quite, quite the opposite. opposite. <laughs> Absolutely. So, you know, very interesting that you talk about you know, being a thought leader on thought leadership. And I've seen, you've given TED Talks and many other uh, uh, spoken at various forums. And I was recently talking to Chip Conley, uh, who has also been in the thought leadership uh, arena Ashley, for a while. He's in my book. Wow, wow. I just had a conversation with him uh, just a couple of days ago. And what I really liked about him, I first met him at the Center for Compassion at Stanford. And he was like the first entrepreneur I know in the San Francisco Bay Area who said, compassion makes good business. And uh, he, he said something very interesting, which is differentiating between the knowledge economy and the wisdom economy. In other words, we have way too much information now. And even, even if you do data mining, it can still be garbage in, garbage out. So just having knowledge is not enough to be able to discern. And I feel thought leadership is in that arena. What is, what's your take on thought leadership and wisdom and where are we heading as, a, as an economy? Wow, big question there, Shankar. Let's see. <laughs> Let's take them one at a time. You know, I've always been intrigued by Chip Connolly. When I heard him speak many years ago for the first time, I thought of him as probably one of the most real people that I've ever heard speak. He just tells such... Um, so he has wisdom, but he really tells truths about his life, about what he's experienced, about what he's thought about. And he's, so he's such a deep thinker in the midst of you know, forming major organizations and building, building change as a change agent. And what I, what I know from my work um, interviewing and working with uh, thought leaders like him on that journey from leader to thought leader, that you know, the best ones are the ones who are about seeking wisdom and sharing wisdom, that, that this is not about hey, look at me, look at me, that this is really about, um, I call it sort of, instead of sage from the stage, it's guide from the side, right? You are, if a, a good thought leader is someone who is on the journey with you, they may be a step ahead of you or two steps ahead of you, but they're not trying to show you how smart they are. They're not trying to um, impress you. They're in, instead trying to inform and engage with you and create dialogue and conversation. And so I think we should take a minute, Ashley, and define what I, how I define thought leadership. Would that make sense? Yes, indeed. In fact, that's why I wanted, wanted to talk to you. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that when I first became interested in this concept of thought leadership, it was really because uh, a client of mine called me up one day and she said, hey, um, you know, Denise, how you became that thought leader in women's entrepreneurship? She said, I want to do that. And Honestly, I remember looking at the phone thinking, I was a thought leader, like that was not a term that I'd ever applied to myself. And honestly, I don't think you should apply it to yourself, you know, let others decide when you're a thought leader. But what it was, um, gave me the opportunity to work with her, um, because in my journey, when I was running the Forum for Women Entrepreneurs, and I was starting Springboard, um, I really became what I call more of an accidental thought leader, meaning that I was 
instituting a lot of change and I had this bully pulpit, this opportunity to be out sharing the wisdom that I was learning, sharing the expertise and the best practices and the ideas of the women entrepreneurs we were working with. But I didn't know what I was doing. You know, I had no strategy. I had no plan. I mean, I, my plan was to grow my organization. My plan was to help women entrepreneurs. It was not to be a thought leader. And so when this client uh, hired me uh, for three years, we really I was really distilling what I had learned um, and working with her to practice and try out a whole bunch of strategies and experiments. And it was through doing that. And then of course, bringing on other clients and interviewing a lot of folks that I started to distill some, some de definitions and some thinking about it. And, you know, I have probably three or four different definitions, but the one that I think really helps people the most is that for me, it's understanding the difference between leadership and thought leadership. So for me, leadership is the construct of one to many. You are trying to influence a group of people, often that you manage, you supervise, you work with, you have some contact with in your community, in your organization. But thought leadership is the concept of many to many. How do you get people who have an idea to carry it forward to their communities? So if you think about how we create a movement, whether it's Black Lives Matter or whether it's the Me Too movement, it isn't one person influencing the people around them. It is getting those people to take those ideas to their communities further and further and further. So it's like ripples in the pond. And the idea of knowing how to galvanize people to not just create change, but to take ideas and carry them forward, that's something we don't learn in college, right? So when I started teaching this online and in, at Stanford and other places and wrote my book, it was really with this this idea of how can I teach people in the macro how to create a movement, but in the micro, how to influence, literally how to influence and get others to take action on behalf of a cause or on behalf of change that needs to happen. And, and when I can help people to see that that's what thought leadership is, a lot more people realize that they are already in some role or another acting as a change agent and they need these skills and they need to understand how to do this. In fact, uh, I remember the book Tipping Point, and that was the beginning of my understanding of like movements of uh, ideas. And I love that uh, you know what I mean? I think it was yeah. uh, Malcolm, Malcolm Gladwell who wrote that. And he summarized the research on uh, how things change over time. And uh, in the old days, it was accidental. And now you can actually do it deliberately too. And uh, whether it is Abraham Lincoln being a thought leader and uh, uh, you know, the freedom of everybody being free or Mahatma Gandhi talking about uh, um, you know, a, a war without weapons, you know, <laughs> for lack of a better word, or how can you get things done without necessarily resorting to physical violence, essentially. Or more recently, I mean, um, what you did, which is basically bringing the, for lack of a better word, I don't know how to even describe it, bringing the softer, gentler leadership skills into the corporate world. You know what I mean? There was this idea of a cowboy leader. In fact, I remember when Netscape was led by Jim Barksdale, they like, that's the way to read it. You bring a guy from Texas and you march along. And, and there were various, I mean, AMD CEO, they, they were fantastic. But that is one form of leadership. What yes. you brought about was a shift in terms of the kind of leadership that can actually galvanize and move people, uh, whether it was the leader of Canva more recently, or uh, which also is a springboard success. To I remember even meeting Sharon Ruard a long time ago, who led Elon, and he was a mentor to Seema, or my own wife Seema, who has a very different style. So there are as many styles of leadership and um, tell us more about, I, I don't like to differentiate between male and female, but there are different styles of leadership and how would you characterize that, especially in the context of thought leadership? So there, you're right, there are as many different types of leaders as there are people in some ways, right? That, that we, unfortunately, what has been taught to us is a very narrow set of skills. And it's very much a, a, a dominant and, you know, we will tell you what to do and you will stay in your box and you will do what you're told, right? And you will not be part of the decision making and you will, like, 
That is just, to me, a very arcane and uh, dissatisfying. Uh, and so when you, when one of my clients did this uh, TED Talk, and her TED Talk was, it's very popular, and she talks about how people don't leave companies, they leave cultures. And if you have a culture where it is that sort of, I will tell you what to do, the sort of, the stereotypically Texas viewpoint of how we shall dominate you and uh, with a big voice and, a, and a talking over you and all of those um, gendered traits that are really unfortunate. We know that that is what causes women to leave. But it's also, interestingly enough, I, I think of it not as a man-woman thing so much as a dominant culture, non-dominant culture, right? So you could be a person of color and find yourself in a place where you're not in the dominant culture and you, you could be male and still have a bad experience of the culture itself. So I think, and you can go into healthcare where it's predominantly women, but if there are some folks who are acting in a certain way, dominant cultures will out, right? And so I think that the, the gift of learning how to lead in different styles, be, having a lot of tools in your toolkit of which one is how to be a better influencer, that's really the only way to survive. And part of what's been so fun in operating in so many different environments, nonprofit, for-profit, big company, small company, is that I've gotten a lot more tools in my toolkit. Yeah, and uh, in fact, what I find amazing is that you worked in healthcare as well, you worked in, um, uh, you know, uh, internet or social media in the very early days, in the 90s, and then you were in uh, hardcore software technologies, pattern recognition, and all the kinds of things. And then, yeah, um, I actually never did. I never did internet myself, but I did help a number of people start those. Before that, I actually, I started my career in the software industry. When you put software in a box and you put it on a shelf, right? And oh, I did okay. consumer software and I did games and I did um, speech recognition and handwriting recognition. So I did a lot of software, some hardware. Um, with the time of the dot-com craze, I was actually working at the Forum for Women Entrepreneurs, helping lots of people start those kind of companies. And then later, um, yeah, my most recent venture is healthcare. But what's been so interesting about it is that it is a company called Futuro Health, an organization. Um, and it was started through, it's a very unique business model. So the idea is Kaiser Permanente, you know, large healthcare system in California, uh, gets together with their largest union, SEIU UHW, and they come to a partnership through a union negotiation to set aside $130 million over four years to help people go back to school to become healthcare workers in California and hopefully over time to other states as well. But this idea that an individual goes back to school and it comes out of someone else's money, right, is really transformative because up until now, as an individual, we must keep our skills up. Like that's the only way to survive in today's world. But if you're a low income person, how do you do that? You don't have extra money in your pocket that you think, oh, I'm just going to go back and become a healthcare worker, right? That just doesn't happen. And also, if you're working outside the healthcare industry, no one is going to give you money to go back to school to get in the healthcare industry. Like if you're working at McDonald's, even if there is a tuition benefit, it's usually for management in McDonald's. It's not often for management in another field or even a low level job in another field. So this transformative model, I think, I hope it will get replicated. And part of the, what excited me about it was to figure out how can you devise this sort of three-legged stool of one organization, the union recruiting these friends and family of their members, Kaiser providing the funding and eventually the clinical placements and some jobs. And then my organization in the center, which was all about connecting these folks that got recruited into healthcare roles through finding them the right educational partners. And so that was going to be the organization I worked for was the first group, which was placing people in school. And then we'll have a, they'll have a second entity, which will be a, a worker co-op that'll actually get these people work and connect them through providing them benefits and connect them to di different uh, clinics and hospitals in California to put them to work. So it's, it's very, I worked on it for a year. I, I kind of rolled up my sleeves and got my, got back into the operational aspects of building a nonprofit. And it was, it was really fun. And I just finished about a week ago. So now I'm, I'm back to doing my thought leadership work. And that's how I was able to get hold of you, I guess. 
I had heard about Futuro and I had been referring people who want to get into healthcare. I had no idea you were involved in it in an executive role. So yes. um, there are so many demographic changes and especially given the pandemic, millions and millions of jobs have been lost. Some of them probably irrecoverably because um, I'm not even sure how much entertainment we need, but we definitely need healthcare, for instance. We Always. definitely need uh, technology in healthcare as well, um, because there's not enough people in healthcare. There's not enough technology in healthcare. There's not enough ease of use in healthcare even today. And we've seen that during this pandemic, not just in the United States, but literally globally. What kind of job opportunities are there for people who are right now struggling or are, are, are at risk of losing their work or their, you know, yeah, I think the hard thing is most of these most of these jobs do require some sort of certification. So the roles that we were training people for, it's a 10 month program. So it's not going to happen overnight. And so there uh -huh. is the, the main role we don't, uh, Futuro Health doesn't do this lowest level role, which is called certified nurse assistant, um, because it's very low pay, um, but it does, it's a much shorter, and that's a, maybe a two month training versus a 10 month training for a medical assistant. Uh, so there's always that struggle, you know, do you, do you train people? People into a role that they can barely make ends meet or do you help them to stay in school long enough that they get a certification that they can make enough money to live on and then scale from there what is good about healthcare is that there is a lot of growth within you know if you do keep getting certifications you can keep growing within your career in some ways even more easily than in tech um, but i do find that the some of those entry-level roles are you know whether it's cleaning the rooms or pushing someone in a wheelchair or whatever. Those roles, they are maybe plentiful, but they're not very well paid. And um, especially given what we are all going through uh, worldwide, uh, the chaos that has ensued and the divisiveness that came with it, um, do you see possibilities for people to um, work on something more meaningful that then, than they're working? I know you've gone through your own fair set of challenges and each time I've seen you grow. So you must have some kind of a maybe idea, suggestion on how people can grow through challenges. Well, let me do this. I'm going to just turn my camera off for a second and turn the light on because it's very dark here. One second. Sure. I think I'm, uh, I'm about to fade into the darkness there. <laughs> Okay. Uh, um, so I, you know, I think that the challenge for all of us is to keep growing. The challenge for all of us is not to get stuck in our cubicle, in our, in our silo, and to, to never look up and look around. And for me, the most critical component is to keep your network that this is from this is how I've been successful throughout my career is I'm, I'm kind of outgoing. <laughs> I kind of like people. And so I keep my connections. I'm, mm. I'm in regular touch with lots and lots of different kinds of people, which is honestly much harder during the COVID shutdown, I will say. But the way I do it is um, I, I both join and I start communities. So for example, I'm running for the last five years, I've run a email list for women authors and another one for women speakers. And so that community also has, we have events and get togethers and share ideas and best practices. So that's one community, two, two communities that I'm a part of, although there's overlap. Then I'm in, I'm in my, um, my uh, college has a business leadership council. So I participate in that. And I'm in a women's network here in the Valley. And then I still participate in my old organizations and I give back um, by volunteering. And so I think for me, what's helped and what's allowed me to keep growing is I try to surround myself with people who are smarter than I am, who are doing really diverse and interesting things. And I try to be of service. It's not about just coming with your hand out. And I think that was what I always instilled at the Forum for Women Entrepreneurs. Like, don't come in here and, and expect that everybody's gonna you know, sit down and provide you a business plan and you know, do all your financials for like, no, what are you bringing to the community? And then you can turn around and expect to get as well. But it, it has to be the communities I'm a part of and the ones that I grow in are the ones where there is a give and there's a get. And so I'm, I'm, my purpose is to come with what I know and what I can offer and then I will thrive in that community so I'm inviting people to look around and figure out which communities will you want to be a part of and oh by the way they don't have to all be work related I also 
well, I'm also, a, I do archery and I'm a member of an archery community. You know, I do theater, I have my theater groups. So it, it can be varied. They don't have to all be work related, but all of those overlapping circles, um, some of them don't overlap at all. Some of them overlap somewhat. That is what allows me to keep falling into new opportunities and saying yes to new groups of people working together. In fact, uh, many people have slowed down during, uh during the pandemic, I see you actually keeping steadily busy and more creative and more different options. Tell us your secret ar around the pandemic because one of the biggest challenges I'm seeing today is not even health. Only about half a percent to maybe 2% are directly getting affected by the virus. And, and in terms of, you know, in, in terms of fat fatality or mortal, and maybe 10 times that much say 20%, but 80% are doing fine. But the anxiety and the restlessness and the feelings of not being wanted or losing a sense of perspective has been challenging. How have you kept your sense of perspective and grown through the pandemic? Well, I will not say it's been perfect by any stretch of the imagination. First of all, I was working in a startup nonprofit and we were a brand new team. I mean, I started working in last August, so it was a year for me, but the team didn't officially come together until January. So when the when the pandemic hit, we the team was only two months old. So it was very much a, you know, we had a lot on our plate, we had a lot of expectations and suddenly, and we didn't know each other that well, and suddenly we're all home, right? So um, it, I guess my life turned from seeing everybody and being part of a group to just nonstop meetings, nonstop face-to-face -face on Zoom and, and Teams and all the different apps, right? Um, but in the evenings, I really stressed getting together with my group. So whether it's, I'm in two different book clubs, they met all the time. Um, whether it's my Stanford group that I went to business school with, my women friends, we get together once a month. So it was continuing to have Zoom calls with groups of people that I like and respect. Um, that's one thing that kept my sanity. Secondly, I will say a little too much ice cream. It definitely helped me keeping my <laughs> sanity. <laughs> and then I think getting outside um, when I could. I haven't, again, I haven't been perfect at any of these things. I've had my down moments. I've had my, my uh, is this ever going to end? Um, but I do have some close friends that we, we talk on a Saturday and commiserate. Um, every weekend, my family, we do game, game time. We have a, that started a few months ago. We do an, an hour or two of um, online games of some sort or another. So we see each other on Zoom and we're all around the country. So that's been fun. It's just a variety of things. But, and then finding things to keep me entertained, whether it's Netflix, good books, um, you know, finding a way to just hang out and, uh, and chill a bit um, when I'm not working. I think it's all, it's all of the above. And then trying to get some enough sleep. I think that's been the hardest for me because when I'm stressed, it's hard for me to sleep. Yeah, a lot of people, including me, our sleep hours have been erratic. And, uh, no matter how much we try. Uh, so very, very important to be disciplined when it comes to resting. Especially uh, when I get involved in a good book or it's a good movie. <laughs> yeah, that's the harder part. And there's nowhere to go. So, okay, I, can, I don't have to get up at six in the morning. It can be up at nine. So <laughs> see how it goes. It's, only been, it's only been a week now that I haven't been working since the pandemic started. So at least not working full time. And so it'll be interesting to see how I keep keep a schedule. I mean, I've, I, fortunately, I have clients and I have things going on, but in, ask me in a month whether I'm getting up <laughs> and getting my eight hours of sleep. It's interesting uh, because we're, I think Seema and I have been playing this game called Where in the World is Denise Brosso? <laughs> so <laughs> where, where do you think you'll be headed next? You've done so many things from healthcare to working in politics and public service to, of it's course, women entrepreneurship and, uh, as you said, archery and uh, games. Um, what you, what's calling you right now at this stage in your life? 
So the, what's been fun about this is if you look back at all of those crazy things that I've done and all the different um, places that I played, it's almost always been about one of two things. It's either about making a big difference. Like even when I got involved on the housing committee in my town, it was because we needed a lot more housing. And I got for eight years, I served on our housing committee to build a lot of housing in downtown Redwood City, which now is there. Um, and so it's always for me about making big change. So that's one thing. So I'm always looking for where's the new change need to happen. But the second is about um, where can I bring my expertise? So what's been fun for returning to my consulting practice is as the thought leader about thought leadership, there's just not that many of us. And so what's fun is uh, my, my online course on LinkedIn Learning, my, um, the articles that I've written, my TED Talk, things like this, bring people to my door who are so interesting. And so the diversity of the conversations and the kinds of people that I can help, to me, that's just joy every day. So that's been um, a total treat. I kept, I kept it even while I was working full time. I was doing some coaching on the weekends, but now I'm back to doing that more full time. And um, what it, that does is it opens doors to new conversations, new, um, a new arena. Like I learned all about hotels last year because I had a, a guy who was working in the hotel industry who wanted to be a thought leader. I, I learned all about philanthropy because this woman, you know, head of a big philanthropic foundation wanted to be a thought leader. So I get this, that to me is what's fun is like, I don't have to go work in any of these organizations. I can learn vicariously and I can help them grow. So I think I'll be doing more of that. And then my new treat to myself, since I cannot get on an airplane, which depresses me to no end. Um, I have decided I'm going to see how many countries I can do a webinar in this year. Wow. So, wow. Right? <laughs> right. Virtual travel. So I have uh, one booked for Germany and I have one booked for the United Arab Emirates and I can call you India, right? So I can- Certainly, uh, certainly. So now I have three, my first three, and I'm going to put a, I have this beautiful map on my wall that has got push pins for all the countries that I've visited around the world. So I'm going to start a new color and I'm going to put push pins for all my webinars. That's my new adventure. I think that's perfect because I have literally friends around the world and I had started on a physical journey of traveling around the world. I called it my dance of compassion. I was in Korea, South Korea, and that was the first one there where I saw everybody in a mask. Then I was in San Francisco, and within a month, we went into shelter in place. Two days before that, I went to Mexico, Chihuahua, Cuernavaca, and Mexico City, and um, there too, Corona caught up. And then I'm back now in India, but um, I'm going to continue. So as you do your webinars, I'll probably be bouncing around again, but... Yeah, and do both. I mean, that's what's fun. You yes. get to talk to people around the world here. In so fact, I think um, many of the viewers on this program are from the countries that I've either visited or plan to visit. Southeast Asia, the United Arab Emirates, um, Africa, and of course, North America, South America, and different parts of Europe and South Asia. But um, uh, is there a website? How can people find out about your webinars? Is there any uh, place where they can uh, reach out to you? Yes, uh, I think the two best places are my website, which is Thought Leadership Lab, T H O U G H T, Thought Leadership Lab.com. And then uh, on LinkedIn Learning, I have two very popular courses on thought leadership there. Uh, and I always, I always want to say one final thing about thought leadership before we close on this topic, and that is that. For me, thought leadership is not just about being known, it is about being known for making a difference. And I'm, I, I insist every time I give a talk to say that because what I, what I fear when people hear that term, thought leader, that it is, becomes a bit of self-aggrandizement, right? Look at how many followers I have, look at how popular I am. And to me, that is not the conversation we're having, right? This is the conversation about thought leadership and why I enjoy the work so much and the people that I get to meet is, is about being a change agent. It is about bringing about hopefully very positive change in the world and, and gaining the skills on how to do that, how to find your niche, how to, how to build followers, how to build connections with um, new communities, build ecosystems and partners. Those are all skills that are about creating change. They're not about 
the other uh, ego piece, right? And of course, we need to have an ego and we need to have passion and commitment. But um, my, my focus for folks, if you're thinking about this journey, and I hope you'll find my book, Ready to Be a Thought Leader, or, or find my courses, that, that you'll really come at it from the perspective of what's the impact you want to have in your life? Like, what's the change you want to bring about? Where, what would you like to be remembered for? Yeah, I would love to share um, your um, website, particularly on thought leadership, and maybe your TED Talks, and, uh, and uh, what are the other resources where people can find about your work that you're currently well, doing and you've done in the past? I think LinkedIn page is pretty up to date. LinkedIn page, okay. Well up there. And people can and, connect with me there. Yes, and uh, Denise, I have to say, I mean, we've known you now for... Believe it or not, it's almost two decades. And uh, <laughs> we're, we're, we're all maturing, we're all growing up. So, <laughs> yeah, we were in our, you know, youth. I think we are. We're, we are. It keeps us young. It keeps us young to be able to do these things, right? Um, Absolutely. What, I, what we've always admired about you was you, there was a cause that you were after, no matter what you were doing. It was never about self promotion. and. Uh, your thought leadership is not about self-promotion, not about narcissism, not even about becoming a president. It is about doing something to serve, almost like servant leadership, and doing something to serve so that it's not, it's not the individual that becomes the hero. In Black Lives Matter, we don't know who started it. At least I don't know. And there are many such movements, even the women's movement uh, about women leaders, you are definitely one of the leaders because Forum for Women Entrepreneurs, but there were many things like GWLN, Global yeah. Women's Leadership Network and all. So this movement of women, many to many, which is possible now in a very effective way using social media, using many to many communication. And I'm so grateful that you've done some of these things. And I hope you continue doing it and will be a part of your journey as well. I so, would welcome that very much. You know, because it's not about you. It's not about a person. It's not about a famous person, but it's about a cause that matters to a lot of people. And there's still work to be done. Yes, yes, yes. As long as we are alive, there's work to be done. And to anybody who is watching us still, please uh, find a way to connect both to Denise direct directly. If you have any questions for me, I will also provide uh, my, <clears throat> my connections. And I'll be, I'll be providing that wherever I post this video. And um, again, thanks a lot for joining us. If you have any more questions and if you need to talk to Denise again, please let me know. Thank you and have a great rest of the day or rest of the night.